Good morning again, everybody, and welcome to anyone who's going to be watching this uh, delayed live online. And I trust that there is an expectation in your hearts uh, this morning for what God is going to impart to us, how God is going to teach us and shape us and change us. Remember, to grow is to change. And we want to embrace every positive element of growth and change that God wants to bring about in our lives. And so it's lovely to take a step in this next part in the series that we have been doing, The Way We Go. And I hope that you've been finding this helpful so far, just thinking about what it means to be on a journey with Jesus. Uh, Because one of the things, just to kind of sum things up, the big picture idea for those of you who have maybe missed or are just with us today, what we've been looking at is this, how Jesus has called all of us to follow him and also to join with him in his mission of bringing the kingdom of God to the people of this world. And while many of us are perhaps familiar with some of the great sending scriptures of the Bible, I'm sure if I were to kind of throw that out to there, what are the big sending passages of the Bible? We might remember, you know, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Or uh, that we're to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. We've said for us, that's like Belmont, Sutton, Surrey, Southeast England, the rest of the United Kingdom, Europe, and it kind of goes out from there. Or Jesus is sending us just as the Father sent him. We know these kind of big, powerful scriptures, but we can look at those passages, and if you're anything like me, we can feel quite overwhelmed in how do we actually live that out? How do we lean into that and obey the things that Jesus has called us to do? And so what we've been doing through the series, what we're going to continue to do over the next couple of weeks, is remind ourselves That these great commissioning scriptures, these great commissioning commands of Jesus to us as his followers, they come at the very end of Jesus' discipleship journey with his followers. There was a whole process of training that led up to that point so that as Jesus says it, they have been prepared to do it. They know exactly what it's going to involve. Because they've done it with him already, they've debriefed it with him, he's been shepherding them and showing them all along the way. And so what we're attempting to do is track backwards a bit and look at the way that Jesus trained his disciples, the first followers, those who would go on to become the early church, and learn some of those key lessons ourselves. So that as we look at those passages, it doesn't sound so foreign to us. What does this look like in my life today? We've actually been on the same journey as those early disciples with Jesus. And so far, we've looked at a couple of really important foundational ideas. We've seen as we go with Jesus, the foundation for that is joy. You know, I don't think that's often what it feels like. You know, you get to church and you hear it's about mission or evangelism or sharing your faith. And the dominant feeling is often not joy. It's fear, you know, or guilt. Or, or, and, and, and that is not the way that we want to operate. It's actually out of joy, with joy that we're able to draw up the wells of salvation and therefore then go and make known the glorious things that God has done. And then we saw that we need to do it wholeheartedly, just as we're to love God with our heart, all our heart and mind and veriness, our strength, we are to be involved in the mission of Jesus in the same way. We saw that we need to do it together. Thankfully, we don't go at it alone. We're together as a community and as a family. And last week, we saw that we need to adapt ourselves to those that we are trying to reach so that anyone who is open to God can have the opportunity to be ministered to by him. So I hope those have been helpful so far. And you ready for the next step? Are you ready? Okay, you are. Excellent. So the next step on this journey is a step towards power and authority. 
Okay? A ministry that is both powerful and authoritative. And I think this has been, perhaps these are words that we can find a little difficult, maybe a bit exciting, maybe a bit difficult, depends perhaps some of the things that you have experienced. But power and authority are a formidable partnership together for the ministry of the kingdom, as they are actually in many environments. And when power and authority are used as they should be, they create environments that are safe. If you've ever been in an environment where there is lawlessness, what you don't feel is safe. What you don't feel is safe. And when you don't feel safe, it's very hard to thrive. It's very difficult to be creative and to love and to have hope and to have peace. But where power and authority are used as they should be, it creates an environment for human flourishing. That is what the kingdom power and authority ideas are all about. However, I know this topic, authority and power, it's not taught a lot in the church today. I think perhaps because these are such difficult words for people to deal with in our time uh, at this point in our cultural moment. There have been so many examples of the destructive use of authority and power that there's a fear to talk about them and to investigate them and even to look at them in the Bible. You know, we have those passages in the Bible that sometimes we kind of like to just skip over, you know, and get to the bits that, that make us feel good. And, and the sad thing is, this is meant to make us feel like that. And yet the experiences of history and culture have kind of put a, put a barb into these ideas and words, even though they are so significant right throughout the entire Bible and obviously central to Jesus' teaching and training of the disciples for the ministry that he was calling them and us to. And so I think while we, it can be really easy for us to have the wrong pictures of what power and authority in the church and ministry is meant to look like, okay? the, uh, the church, particularly the church, has not done a good job of reflecting Jesus' teaching and ideas of what authority and power are meant to look like. And so hopefully this morning, okay, we can paint a different picture for our hearts and minds. A biblical picture for our hearts and minds of what this can look like, how wonderful, significant, and important it is to lean into it. So let me pray for us, and then we can jump into this really rich, significant theme and just open it up a bit for us today. And hopefully uh, ask some good questions of some helpful passages that can give us some good grounding and footing to take steps forwards with Jesus together. So Father, I thank you. I thank you for your kingdom, that Jesus, you are the king, and you are the one with all authority, you said, just before you sent the disciples, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Lord, we thank you that authority is your idea, that you are the most powerful being in all creation. You are the one who has created everything. And so, God, as we come to understand how power and authority is meant to operate in our lives and in the church, we thank you that we come to the one who actually understands it, who has created it, who holds all of it. And Lord, we pray that you would release your kingdom, a kingdom of authority. We pray that your kingdom would come in us, in this place, and in and through us as we minister for you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Amen. Okay. So a little sort of tidbit to get us going. You know we've been in Luke's gospel as a kind of backbone for this, particularly in chapter 9 and 10, and then the second part of Luke's message in Acts chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 9 is the place to open them or switch them onto, whichever kind of version you're using. I'll have a little bit of it on the screen here. So Luke chapter 9, verse 1. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons, to cure diseases, and he sent them out 
to proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. Now, remember, we've been uh, understanding that the way we read the Bible is often the first time you hear about something in the scriptures, you get the most detail. After it's been mentioned once, they can just allude to it, and you are able to reference back to it. So this is really important because this is the first time that Jesus is going to send his followers to continue the ministry that he's been doing. So this is critical, foundational for us. Every time we hear about mission and ministry following on from this point, these scriptures and words almost need to be in the back of our minds and in our hearts. And right here you see the very first verse, the, the one thing that the disciples are going to need in order to do the ministry that Jesus is calling them to, the first thing they need to receive is power and authority. Do you notice how important this is going to be for everything the church is going to do? All the ministry of the kingdom flows out of this foundational bedrock idea. So, really quick definition what these words mean. Power, the Greek word dunamis, you think of dynamite, it's where we get it, okay? And it means physical power or force, might, ability, energy. The capacity to do something. How you feel after your first cup of coffee in the morning. <laughs> okay? Uh, or you know that wonderful feeling when you wake up and, you know, it happens occasionally for us. You wake up and you think, wow, I feel like I've got energy for this day. You know, it doesn't seem to happen every day. And, and on those days, you've got to really make the most of it. You know, you've woken up with power, you know, with energy. You didn't even need the coffee uh, that morning. Okay, so it's power, ability, capacity to act. The second is authority, the Greek word here, exousia. And it means the right or privilege to be able to do something. Okay? It's the jurisdiction to use a particular force in a particular way. So what's happening here? Jesus gives the disciples the ability to do something and he gives them the privilege to do it. He gives them the authority to do it. He gives them the ability and he gives them the privilege. And so we see from this passage the anticipated use of this power and authority. It's not for their own privilege. How often is power and authority in the world today used for people's own privilege? So that I can have, so that I can be up and above everyone else and people can serve me and this feels great and, and they get to do everything and I get to kind of relax and be at the top of the pyramid. And that is not at all the way that kingdom authority and power operates. The purpose of the power and the authority is to equip them to bring healing, restoration, spiritual freedom, hope, peace, joy, the joy of the kingdom of God to the people who desperately need it. You know, on a personal level, I think it's been understanding this teaching on power and authority that has probably had the biggest impact on my ministry and the way that I've seen the kingdom of God kind of work through me and in the lives of others over the last 15 years. I mean, this understanding, and, and I realized for a long time, you know, I kind of read the Bible and read these words and it didn't mean anything to me. It kind, they were words and concepts, but they had no grounding in my actual experience, in the way that I lived day to day, in the way that I prayed for people, in the way that I did what I'm doing now, in the way that I shared my faith with my friends, in the way that I would pray, about, pray for other people in the issues that they were facing. This understanding this has made probably the single biggest difference to my ministry over the last 15 years. And, and this whole idea of power and authority bringing healing, restoration, freedom, hope, joy, the message of the kingdom, isn't even just rooted in the Gospels. It goes back even further than that. It's rooted in the Old Testament expectation of what it would be like for the Messiah to come. Remember Messiah 
is just a transliteration. It's an English letters of the Hebrew that means anointed one. Okay? Messiah means anointed one. If you translate Messiah, you, you can't, we're almost speaking Hebrew when we say that word. If you translate it, it means anointed one. And it's a reference back to Isaiah chapter 61. <laughs> did, did that just say what I was saying? In, okay, I, <laughs> I don't know how that happened. I spoke it over here and it came out of Victor's phone. Amazing. Okay, so, so the expectation of the Messiah to come. And so what is happening is Jesus is now delegating his messianic authority and power to his followers that they can continue his work. Look at this, Isaiah chapter 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me. Okay? This is the Messiah passage. This is what the Messiah is going to be doing. The ministry of the Messiah. It's what Jesus, as he stands up to read from the scroll of Isaiah, and he says, this is who I am. This is what he reads from. Why have I been anointed, Jesus says, to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for captives, release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, what we were praying into a little bit earlier in the service, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of of despair, and they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities. This is the ministry of the Messiah. And this is the ministry the Messiah is passing on to his followers. That the Spirit of God is on him and will be on us to authorize us and empower us to preach the gospel, to heal the brokenhearted, to set people free from spiritual darkness, to declare a new age of the favor and grace of God, to share the hope that the justice of God is coming for those who have been unjustly treated. You know, we speak about justice and wrath, and if you've never been unjustly treated, that doesn't really sound so great. You, you know, but when you have been unjustly treated, when you've experienced injustice, when you've been wounded, when you've been treated as you shouldn't have been treated, and you know God is coming to set the tables right, the coming of God justice, God's justice is actually a beautiful and wonderful hope to empower a life of joy rather than a life of sorrow and despair. How much do we need that in our world today? And this ministry, this power, this authority has been anointed upon Jesus. It's been anointed upon us that humanity would be saved and transformed. And so in effect, we get to, to, to Luke chapter 9, if you've still got it open in your Bibles. And what is Jesus saying? He's saying to you and to me that I am empowering you and I am authorizing you to go and speak about my kingdom. And with power and authority, bring healing to everyone who is open to me. In all the multifaceted pictures of what healing means. Power and authority to share the message. Power and authority to do the signs of the kingdom. So that the ministry of the Messiah could be replicated in his followers. What an amazing thing Jesus is making available to us. It's a bit like... I don't know if you've ever done a job shadow. Have you ever done a job shadow with someone where uh, they, they, they did it when, when we were leaving school and you kind of have a career that you're interested in and then you get to go and be with that person who is you know, working out and living in that career and you get to kind of shadow them for a couple of days and see what it's like. You know? And depending on what it is, you know, they maybe even let you do a few things. You, know, you get to, to press the button that they normally get to press. <laughs> 
you know, or enter in the, in the numbers that they would normally enter in, or draw something that they would normally draw, or, you know, take someone's temperature, or listen to their heart, whatever it is, you get brought into their world to partner with them in what they're doing. And Jesus is saying, right, disciples, you've seen what I've been doing, and now the apprenticeship starts. And remember, discipleship means apprentice. That's the idea, that we get to apprentice to the ministry of the Messiah. Now, if all this is a little bit confusing for you, like first time I'm hearing about power and authority and ministry and how is this meant to work in me, I don't get it. If, if you're feeling lost, don't worry. Okay? You're in good company. All the disciples and basically all of Israel didn't get it. For a long time, they didn't get it. What's interesting is that if you go in your Bibles just a few pages before to Luke chapter 7, we get an account which is really insightful and helpful to explain to us what does spiritual authority actually look like in a ministry context. And it's not by accident that just before authority and power is given to the disciples, we have a little teaching moment to say, this is what it's all about, everyone, and this is what it means. And the interesting thing is it doesn't come from Jesus directly. It doesn't even come from the disciples or someone in Israel. It comes from a centurion who understands what authority is all about. So if you go back to Luke chapter 7, we find this little account. Jesus, uh, when he finished saying uh, all of this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum, where a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him and asked him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. Now here, verse 8, look at this. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes. And that one come and he comes. I say to my servant do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him and turning to the crowd following him now you can imagine this so you've got all the crowd of all the disciples and all the Israelites and we've got a centurion a Roman you know occupying Israel and now Jesus is going to say you know what guys the Roman guy gets it and you guys didn't <laughs> so sort of imagine how that goes down he said I tell you I have not found such great faith even in Israel <laughs> and among my disciples. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Hey, there's, there's some important lessons that we're meant to take from this passage in chapter 7 and into chapter 9 as we engage with what God has given to us. So look at this. This is what the centurion understands about authority. The first thing he understands is that submission and authority are inseparable from one another. Okay? You can't walk in authority if you don't also walk in submission. The centurion says, I myself am a man under authority. In other words, I am submitted to someone with greater authority than me. And because I am submitted to that greater authority, I'm able to say to this person, go, and this person come, and they do it, not because of me, but because I answer to Caesar. And they don't want to mess with him. <laughs> and I am a conduit of the authority of Caesar. It flows into me and out of me because I am submitted to it. And therefore, I can operate with his authority. And then the centurion says, but I recognize something about Jesus. I recognize he's like me. In this way, he is submitted 
to a greater authority. And therefore, when he speaks, it's not just Jesus who speaks. It is the authority that is behind him that's at work. Jesus was submitted to his father. And what does Jesus say? Even in John chapter 5, very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the father doing. And when Jesus is in the garden, what does he say? Not my will, but your will be done. Jesus comes, the most powerful and authoritative person that has ever walked this earth, and he lives 100% submitted to his Father in the way that he does everything that he does. And so what we learn here about the authority of the kingdom is it flows. It flows from the greatest source, which is God, And it then flows through us and to the degree that we are submitted to him and to those he says we need to be in submission to, that authority is able to flow through us. And so it flows through as a delegated authority and the power works alongside it to enable what is commanded to come to be. And this is the way Jesus does all of his ministry And the way that he trains all of his disciples to do the same ministry too. You know, um, canals. How many of you have spent time on canals with the locks? You know, we grew up kind of on a, uh, we'd have holidays on the boat on the Thames and you kind of go up the Thames and you get the locks and you kind of go up to the next level. You know, when the gates closed, the river kind of stops at that point, doesn't it? It can't flow. When the gate opens up, the water can kind of flow. Uh, well, it's a bit more complex than that, but you get the idea. Okay? The gates can either be open or they can be open or they can be closed. And so to the degree that we are open to God, to the degree that we are surrendered and submitted to Him, to the degree that we are submitted to those in godly authority around us, walking and living out a submissive godly life, to that degree we can minister with the authority of the kingdom. And I think this is one of the reasons that this is tricky for us because the key or the gate to doing this is submission and submission's not a popular word in our culture today. It's even less popular than authority. (laughs) It's not seen as a positive idea. We live in a world that tells you no one has the right to be above you. You don't have to submit to anybody. You are your own master, you know, the king of your own castle. You determine your own destiny. You get to decide what you want to do with your life. You don't submit to anyone. And it's true, we can live like that. That is a way to live. (laughs) And it's a way that's very popular in society today. And we can make that choice to live like that, to live the way the culture would want us to live. However... Until we learn to walk in godly submission, in the ways that God has called us to live, we can't function in the way that Jesus calls us to do ministry. It just doesn't work. And a lot gets lost. Remember when um, Jesus has been raised to life, he's been teaching the disciples about the kingdom of God for 40 days, and he gets to the bit where they're about to be commissioned and sent out. And he says to them, Do not leave Jerusalem, but what? Wait. Why? For the coming of the gift of my Father, the Holy Spirit, and when he comes, what will they receive? Power. We can't do the ministry of the Messiah without authority and power. It just doesn't work. Now, just a reminder, this authority and power is not to be able to control people and get them to do what, I'm what, what, what we want. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's not the way it works. As I said, Jesus, the most powerful and authoritative person that walked the earth, and yet almost no human authority and power. He wasn't a part of the Sanhedrin, the religious power. He didn't come from a wealthy family sort of monetary power. Power has has money attached to it in our world, doesn't it? He wasn't the commander of a great army behind him. He had 12 disciples, 
Okay? Some of them were fishermen, some of them were tax collectors, you know. If he were to try and invade Rome with his 12 disciples, I think they would have laughed at the gates, wouldn't they? There was no physical force behind it. And yet, they marveled at his authority and his power. He doesn't control anyone. He doesn't make people do what he says. He just offers another way. In fact, he gives loads of opportunities for people to walk away from him and to disobey him. Complete opposite often to the way that we try to work. Get people to do what we want. You know, I'm not surprised that in the seasons of the church's history where they've had the most worldly power, wealth, political influence, ability to control people through fear and coercion, that in those times the church has seen the least spiritual power. The least spiritual power. Yet you go to the places where the church has no influence politically, no financial influence, no kind of military behind them, and what do you see so often? The power of the kingdom of God transforming people's lives. You see, this works in a very different way to the way we're used to. The ministry of the kingdom is about truth and change. Kingdom's not a theory. It's not a philosophy just to believe in your head. It's not a kind of inner way to your own idea of self-actualization. It's a way of living connected to God and his kingdom that changes us radically from the inside out and others through us as we surrender to him. It's access to the Eden-like life as a precursor to the new Eden that is to come. And that includes physical healing. It includes spiritual deliverance. It includes emotional restoration. And that's complex and nuanced, and we understand that. Some of it doesn't all come, but a lot does. And a lot more would if we would understand and learn to do ministry the way Jesus has taught us. In Romans chapter 15, I'm not sure how many of you remember this passage, Paul makes the case that he's fully preached the gospel to the Gentiles. You can kind of imagine it. It's a bit like me sitting in a review meeting with my trustees you know, and, and get asked the question, so Jason, have you done your job properly? This year, <laughs> you know, and I've got my job description and you kind of answer it and hopefully most of the things I have and some of the things I'm, I'm learning. And, and, and so this is like Paul's defense of his ministry. This is how he proves that he has fully discharged the role that was given to him. And he says, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of God. Look at what he says in Romans chapter 15. He says, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done. By the power of signs and wonders through the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. You can't fully proclaim the gospel of without also doing its ministry. They go together. They're actually an inseparable whole. Imagine we were to take the ministry out of the Gospels and only have the teaching. We wouldn't have the Gospels anymore, would we? We'd have a version. We'd have half, you know, or maybe even less, because so much of it is Jesus doing the work. Or if we were to take the book of Acts and take out the things they did and only keep in the teachings. How much would we have lost? How much does the world lose when we only try to teach them and we don't try to do it? And we don't actually release the grace of the kingdom at the same time. The effects of the kingdom are always meant to partner with its message. Okay, so what's, on, what's the next step? How do we go from here in power and authority? Okay, we're going to hand it out at the door. You just open your hand and we give it to you. No, <laughs> that would be great, wouldn't it, if it worked like that? I mean, sometimes it does, actually. Um, but on a whole, it's more of a process. So what are some of the things that we can do 
to help us to grow in this. Because I'm guessing that this is maybe new, a new idea for some of us today. So, so here are three things that you can lean into as a first step. Remember, the commission comes at the end of the journey. So if this is the beginning of your journey, then enjoy the journey of learning and tracking and watching and experiencing through the lives of others so that you know what to do as it comes your turn. So here's the first step. I think, as I mentioned, this is maybe new for some of you. So why don't you go home this week and reread the passages that I've mentioned and just read over them for yourself. You know, if you can't find it in the Bible, then I've probably got something wrong. (laughs) <laughs> you need to find it in the Bible yourself and be able to say before God, yes, I get it, I see it. You can't live on my faith. You have to live on yours. And so go and investigate. Go read through the Gospels and watch the way that Jesus does the ministry that he does. It's all a ministry of authority and power. All of the ministry, it's authority and power. Okay. Become familiar with the Bible's teaching on this. That's a great first step, okay? I know all of you can do that. Second step, you could begin to do in parallel to this. This is like a bit, this can touch us a bit more, okay? It's examine your heart in the way that you respond to people who have authority around you and maybe even over you in a godly way. What happens in your heart when you are required to do something that's not your preference? (laughs) <laughs> remember it's not submission if it's not, unless it's not your preference if someone in authority asks you to do something and you agree with them and you do it that's not submission that's agreement we all love agreement that's great we're all on the same page submission is when you don't agree and it's not your preference and it's not the way that you do it but as an act of worship to God and faith and trust In him, not the person, you surrender to God and submit and willingly worship in that way. Does that make sense? You can never force someone to submit to you. You can control someone and you can coerce them and you can make them afraid, but that's not submission. And that's not godly leadership. Godly leadership is always only ever an invitation. Submission is always a choice. Um, And so we choose to submit. How's your heart when you have the opportunity? (laughs) An opportunity to submit. Jason, I don't know if I like those opportunities. (laughs) But how's your, what goes on in your heart when you have those God-given opportunities to willingly choose to submit to someone else? Okay. And then thirdly, perhaps the easiest, is to pray. God, would you teach me about this? Would you teach me to do ministry with authority and power that's life-giving and not controlling, but invitational like you? Would you teach me how to do that? Would you fill me with your Holy Spirit and power that I could do the kind of ministry that Jesus did? Because I want to proclaim the gospel fully. Because that's what you've called us to do.